And um, I hope you can see some parts of it that remind you of, uh, of what you saw in the lab. Like, so in the lab, did you see anything that looked exponential? Re uh, think back to your LC circuit that you did in the lab. So uh, in case, you know, um, it's maybe easier to see uh, the picture of what you saw. So in the lab, this is what you should have seen. That, you know, the volt applied voltage suddenly changes and your circuit rings. Like this is what you have seen, right, in the lab. So if you are having trouble um, seeing the exponential portion of this, let me draw the envelope. So, I, I mean, you can clearly see the oscillatory portion, right? That's the thing you're supposed to measure frequency of or period of. The envelope is this. Uh, when we say envelope, what we mean is we imagine this entire form as a result of a product, um, as a product of an oscillatory function that's, uh, uh, let me do that in red, as an oscillatory function that's the actual just the sine wave, or in this case cosine, um, cosine wave whose amplitude is not changing. And you imagine factoring out this variation of amplitude to a single non-oscillatory function that you are going to multiply to this uh, oscillatory function. That's what we mean by envelope. It's because that's sort of what it looks like. This is the envelope of this function. So each time where it's a maximum here, local maximum here, that's uh, the point that's showing the envelope. And um, so it, the envelope sort of gets mirrored. So here's the envelope on the other side. And so, so what does this envelope look like? Yeah, this is the exponential decay, right? And that's what you are saying here. This is the exponential decay function that is being multiplied to your oscillatory function. Because when you have a, this is a complex or imaginary exponential, then whenever you see something like e to the i omega t, you recall this formula here. So e to the i omega t can be expanded out this way. Cosine of omega t plus i times the sine of omega t. Okay, uh, let me pause and address one last question. So as you look at this, um, I hope if you think about this for too long or the right amount of time, I hope it at some point um, bothers you that this charge as a function of time, that this is a complex number. Because, I mean, even the word imaginary number has this slur attached to it. It's an imaginary number. The way it was introduced to you was that, you know, you can count one, two, three apples, but you cannot count an I apple. Like what does two I apple mean? So at least when it was originally introduced, there is this stigma attached to the imaginary number I that it does not represent anything physical. You are trying to get an answer for a physical quantity, for a physical amount of charge T. So, but the solution that you guessed and got an answer to is a complex function. So how do you go from something that's complex, that has imaginary stuff attached to it, to something that's supposed to be measurable and real? Yes? So you can square if you are, um, that's what we do in quantum mechanics actually. You, you don't quite square, you multiply with a complex conjugate. That's how you take the absolute value square over any complex number. We're not gonna get go to that um, today. Um, it, there's, so that's one mathematical procedure. Usually you do that um, when you are trying to get a, something that's a kind of like an energy. So in quantum mechanics what you do is you have something called the probability amplitude that has no physical meaning but by squaring it, you get the probability density that has an actual physical meaning. You might have heard these words in chemistry, maybe. Um, so um, that's physics 4C, we won't get there. Here, we are trying to uh, get to not the amount of energy that's stored in the charge, but the actual, um, so this is what we would like. We want to know the actual amount of charge on the capacitor as a real function. That's really what we are trying to get. And it feels like we are somewhere close here because we have something that's oscillatory, 
multiplying with something that's exponential, which matches what we saw experimentally. So uh, there should be a single mathematical step where we can get from something that's complex and maybe doesn't quite exactly represent the physical picture to something that is real and we can say without any doubt that that represents a physical picture. So, any ideas? Well, once I say it, it's gonna sound silly. So the way we get to this uh, real function of Q of T is that we're just gonna say, mm, we're just gonna say, we're going to put this through the mathematical operation of taking the real part. So we are going to say our real um, Q of T is going to be equal to this complex Q of T that we found except we are only going to take the real part of this complex Q of T. This is the last step that will get you from this complex function to a real function, which you can say, like you don't need to interpret anything. You can say, well, that is my Q of T as a function of time. So here, um, let, me do it, uh, let me do it once naively. And then I will show you an additional consideration that you should remember for a more complicated question. So this last bit is something that I would never ask you on an exam. So this is something that you don't have to worry about, but for the exam. But um, when you, so in, the reason I'm introducing this now is because I believe this will come up again in your future engineering class. When you are doing upper division level work, you will eventually see something like this again. If you are dealing with something that's uh, oscillatory, Fourier analysis, you are going to see something like this again. That's why I think there's a value in me introducing this now, even though it's kind of non-standard. So, um, so you know, you will see that again later. But for now, let me show you a naive, very reasonable mistake you can make, and I will show you how to correct that mistake. So. When you imagine taking the real value here, so you might take this and write down, all right, so my Q of t as a complex function, as a complex function is equal to, um, I have this real part, let's factor that out, Q naught e to the minus r over 2lt times, and I have this portion which is complex, I am going to use Euler's formula to separate out the real part and imaginary part. And say that this is equal to um, cosine of omega t plus or minus i times the sine of omega t. Yep. And what I would uh, naively say is that when I take the real part of this to get the actual, you know, to get the actual charge as a function of time. Um, so taking real part, that's exactly what it sounds like. I look at this imaginary portion, say I don't want it, so don't write it down. <laughs> I simply copy down the real part. The Q naught times e to the minus, Q naught times e to the minus r over 2lt times the real part, cosine of omega t. And I keep saying this is what you would do naively because um, you would do it and this will actually be the correct answer. Um, so, so you try to put this into the initial condition, right? Initial condition where you say, um, where you say, you know, at time equals zero, you have some amount of charge and um, at time equals zero, you have zero current. And if you use this function as the, your um, guess the solution, use this real function as your guess the solution to it, it'll satisfy all the conditions. You plug this into this differential equation, um, you will, you should see that it all works out, I think. Wait, does it work out? Oh, I don't think it actually works out. If you take the derivative, well, okay, so, Well, it works out in at least one sense. It, um, it works out to give you the correct initial charge. 
But I think the place where you will begin to see it fail is if you try to look at the current. But anyways, um, so, so once again, I keep saying this is the naive answer because it's missing out some portion of it. Might actually be correct. So let me um, give you a um, slightly, let me tweak this problem a little bit and show you where this does not actually, in no way, is the correct answer. And um, show you how, um, how you should have interpreted all of this so that you can get the correct answer every single time. So, so this is the scenario I want you to um, think about. So for this particular setup, I started out with this set of initial conditions. At time equals zero, my current is zero. And at time equals zero, my charge is Q naught. That, that's how I started out this setup, right? And what I want you to imagine is, imagine shifting the time a little bit so that this is your time equals zero. So at your time equals zero, initial condition is not that all the energy is in the capacitor and no energy in the inductor, but all the energy is in the, in the inductor and no energy in the capacitor. Now, when you try to come up with a solution that matches this, uh, this new, uh, new initial condition, where you say, the, let me do the new initial condition in red, where you say current at time equals zero is your maximum current, so all the energy is in the inductor, and the charge at time equals zero is zero, no energy on the capacitor. Then the things we did um, seems to break down because so here we are working with a general solution. So nothing here really should have changed. And all you are supposed to do is you know, plug in the initial conditions here and determine these constant parameters. But if you start from this expression here, you will see that there's no way to get to the correct answer because um, uh, or sorry, not. So if you start from this expression here, um, no, um, no value of Q naught will give you the correct answer because when time equals zero, well, so Q naught is Q naught zero. You don't want to say Q naught is equal to zero. That sounds like the trivial solution. So where uh, where did I go wrong? Where was the naive mistake made? So I will tell you this much. Um, like up to this point. So I can at least get back this far and do the correct things. All the mistakes that were made was on, made on this corner of the board. Well, there's really one mistake that was made. So I di really did mean when I said that this parameter here is complex. This is really a complex number. And I guess this is really uh, the significance of saying that a number is complex number. When you have a real number, real number has only one free parameter. Complex number always has two free parameters. It is A and B. In fact, do you, do you guys remember complex plane? Wait, complex plane gets covered in pre-calculus, right? Uh, geometric representation with the x-axis being real, y-axis being imaginary. This is pre-calculus material, I'm pretty sure, yeah. <laughs> Review it when you need to. Um, you, for the, um, so the reason I want to bring a complex plane is your textbook will talk about these circuits in terms of phasor. And, um, Phaser is very complicated, doesn't, I don't know, it never really made sense to me. But if you treat this as complex numbers, and you think of the phaser diagrams in your textbook as a simply graphical representation of complex plane, then everything is consistent, makes mathematical sense. So uh, what I'm trying to say, this uh, Q naught here, this constant parameter, you actually need uh, two free parameters to describe it. The way you are Im most of you are imagining was this Q naught was a simply a real number Q naught here. Well, actually, if you are thinking of something that has magnetic Q naught, 
there's an infinite number of possible values that this can take. Infinite number of these, you know, uh, any of the points around this circle of radius Q naught. So this, um, this constant value, it could have taken this value, I Q naught, where Q naught is still real. Or it could have taken any other intermediate value, any other point where, so it would be the, the uh, Q naught real and Q naught imaginary. The only condition you would have to satisfy is that um, the length of this is, so the real squared plus imaginary squared is equal to Q naught squared. So, um, so there's a, a second way of representing complex numbers that makes this geometric relationship clearer. So this is the Cartesian representation. The other way of representing complex number is as, so complex number G as some um, magnitude, magnitude, I don't want to use R. Um, well, magnitude g, the absolute, some kind of idea of length of g times e to the i theta. And when you write out e to the i theta, that's cosine theta plus i sine theta. The cosine theta portion gives you the projection along the real or the x-axis. And the i, so sine theta portion gives you the projection along the y or the imaginary axis. So, so that was the mistake being made. So when I was taking the real part here, I couldn't just take the real part of this portion of the expression alone. Really what I had to consider was this, that, um, that Q naught was a complex number, that this is really represented as A plus IB, and this is represented as uh, B, uh, sorry, C plus ID, and before I take the real part, I have to imagine expanding this out, and when you have A plus IB times C plus ID, the real part of this entire product is not simply A times C. Because let me write this out. When you write out this, this is what you get. A times C, so that is there. It's, it, it's part of it, but when you do the whole cross product, uh, cross multiply or whatever, you know, you, when you expand it out, you have, um, so IB times ID, that will give you I squared or minus one times B times D. So you have AC minus BD. So this is the entirety of the real part. And then you have plus IB times C, plus ID times A. So I times um, BC plus AD. So the mistake that's being made here is that I'm taking only this portion and think that that's the entire real part where there's this minus BD also. So, um, so you know, if you're interested, that's where you can sort of rewrite this in terms of, so that's where you get actually your two free parameters that you need for this second order differential equation. So to go from this general solution to specific, or sorry, particular solution, you need to determine two free parameters. And this contains actually those, both of those two free parameters uh, in terms of its real part and the imaginary part. So, um, yeah, so this is, uh, um, so you know, it's a lot of information to in uh, a single hour. And, um, but this is the place where it's uh, most uh, um, clear, um, the advantage of uh, using this complex exponential to look for a solution to this uh, differential equation is. The advantage is clearest in this example, because if you're imagining uh, guessing this solution using any other real function you know, it's gonna be much, much harder. Um, with this expon complex exponential, um, so th there's a complication that comes into the interpretation, but you can at least, you can at least follow the, the algebra that you have seen. The algebra is not nothing that you couldn't handle. It's the final interpretation piece that uh, muddies the water a little bit.